Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the next uh, lecture in the Dean's Leadership Lecture Series. Uh, I'm afraid I have to begin with some sad news. Uh, one of our students passed away this past weekend, uh, Edmund Mensa, who was a second year student in our doctorate in public health program, uh, passed away, I believe, on Sunday. Edmund brought insight, class, integrity, and a beaming smile to every room he entered. He devoted his career to improving the health of his colleagues as the Director of Occupational Health at Westchester Medical Center. He was in the early stages of his dissertation here at NYMC. He was a man who loved his family, his job, his advanced studies in the doctoral program, and his classmates. New York Medical College is proud of our friend Edmund, and he will be missed. I ask for just a brief moment of silence to honor his contributions to our school and our lives. Thank you. very much and I would like to propose that we dedicate this session to the memory of Edmund Mensa without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm extremely delighted, very excited to introduce our speaker. We are all in for a big treat uh, because Dr. April Smith Harak is the Regional Health Administrator acting for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services covering Region 2, which is this region of the United States and the Caribbean territories. In her acting role as regional administrator, she is also full-time deputy regional administrator, so she has to do both jobs at the same time, an unenviable set of responsibilities. <clears throat> She's responsible for public health leadership across the region, which includes besides New York State and New York City, uh, New Jersey, and of course, as I said, the Caribbean. She assists in administration of that regional office uh, for specifically programs in minority health, population affairs, women's health, the HIV regional resource network. And in addition, she leads and participates in initiatives in several key focus areas, including control of opioids, behavioral health, chronic and infectious disease prevention. Prior to her work in the region, uh, she was at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, in Atlanta, where she worked in the Office of the Director on issue management, short-term policy, and managing the agency's regulatory activity. During her time at CDC, she addressed a broad range of public health areas, including nutrition, physical therapy, diabetes education, environmental health policy, clinician outreach and communication, emergency response and preparedness, and public and private public health partnerships. She also served as a member of the policy team for the White House Conference on Aging. She has a PhD in psychology from Yale, where she conducted research with the Rudd and Pace Centers, focusing on social and health psychology and on issues surrounding obesity stereotyping and discrimination. You can see this is a very varied background with responsibility for many different areas in federal public health policy that impact us all. So um, I should mention too that she got her undergraduate degree also in psychology. So we are in good hands this afternoon with Dr. April smith Harak. Let's show her a warm New York Medical College welcome. Thank you. So let's see, is this working? You all can hear me? Okay. You always have to ask, and I'll try not to I don't know, cause feedback and all of those good things. Um, so that was a really big welcome, and there's no pressure now. <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Uh, I had any number of things I could have spoken with you about, and, and as Rob mentioned, we cover the entirety of public health. 
when people ask me, you know, how do you do that job? I say, well, we, we take one issue at a time and one day at a time. And so our priorities are constantly changing, although we do cover all of public health in my office. You know, we do place emphasis on, on different public health issues at different times. So um, just to give any of you who are not familiar with our department an idea, the federal public health workforce is you know, around 100,000 people. I don't know the current number because we have contractors and, and uh, employees and we've had a number of hiring freezes. So I, I may be overestimating at this point. But if you see that little red star on the screen, which I'm told this pointer will work if I hold down this button. Nope, the top one, there we go. Oh, and I'm, I'm not as technologically advanced as my three-year-olds. Okay, so here we go. If you look at what we have up here is the secretary and then all of these are assistant. Those are the ones that you may be more familiar with, the FDA, CMS, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the CDC, NIH, and Indian Health Service. Uh, many of you are working on environmental issues, that would be ATSDR. And then we have our human services side as well with uh, the assistant uh, Secretary or uh, Administration for Children and Families, and we also have uh, the, let's see, is this the new model? I don't see ACL here, but we have, uh, they, they used to be called AOA, the Administration on Aging, and they, over the last five years or so, have transitioned to the Administration for Community Living, and they cover um, disability as well as aging now. Uh, and then, of course, we have which is no small uh, area of work for us these days, the Substance Abuse Mental Health uh, Services Administration, SAMHSA. So we cover everything. My office uh, is the Assistant Secretary for Health's office. We used to be known as OPHS, the Office of Public Health and Science, and now we are the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. And we also house the Surgeon General and the Public Health Service within the office, as well as a number of programs uh, any of you who are public health aficionados know uh, the Healthy People 2020, 2030 is coming up. There's lots of listening sessions on 2030. I encourage you to comment. But that's out of one of the offices within the Assistant Secretary for Health's office. Uh, so we cover a lot. <laughs> uh, here in the region, uh, we have myself, a regional uh, health administrator, and we have regions uh, across the country. We, I have nine counterparts in all the different regions, and you can see on the map where our regions play out. We do a lot to be the rough translation between the federal government and the state and local entities that we represent. So it's really our job to promote uh, federal health initiatives, to be aware of any emerging issues, and to, to work with our state health officials, our local health officials, and our community organizations to help everybody uh, in our region achieve optimal health, which is a tall order, but that's our goal. So how do we do that? We engage with our health officials, we partner with other, and you see staff divs and optives, that's just government speak for other organizational units and other federal agencies. And then we collaborate with our regional stakeholders. And sometimes that means non-traditional partners. Uh, you know, most recently we've done a lot of work with public safety in the opioid epidemic. It's not a group that we usually chat with very much, but it turns out we make, a, we make good partners when we need to work together to address a specific issue. Uh, and then we maintain our regional networks, networks and we provide a lot of situational awareness back to headquarters, which is uh, really important so that the, the policy that's being driven from a federal level can be reflective of the environment of the country. And this is a little bit more about how we do our work. So basically what I thought I would do today is I wasn't sure who, how many of the, the audience would be students and how many would be faculty or other interested parties. So I just thought we could cover a few of our big priority areas, probably things you've been hearing about in the news. So I'm gonna talk with you about opioids, I'm gonna talk with you about HIV, and I will speak a little bit about uh, HPV, hepatitis, uh, not hepatitis, we're working also on hepatitis C, but um, many of those efforts are intertwined with the opioids and HIV efforts. 
because they're uh, not unrelated. So you may have been seeing uh, information about the ending the HIV epidemic uh, initiative that's coming through right now. And it, 700,000 American lives lost to HIV since 1981 is a pretty staggering figure. Uh, and if we don't intervene, then another 400,000 can be lost. Uh, the, the interesting thing about HIV is that in 1981, when HIV was, was first uh, identified, it, it was a death sentence. And now it is no longer a, that death sentence. It is a manageable, almost chronic condition if treated properly and identified. And the stigma that comes from the initial stages of the identification of the disease and that outbreak still follow, even though the, the the development of treatment has, has not justified that stigma. So we have our work cut out for us. But what we've realized is that right now we got to this point where we do have the tools and we have the ability to stop the HIV epidemic, which is something that we, as, as a public health person, your goal in life is to put yourself out of business. If, if you don't have a job, that means everybody is healthy and they're doing the things that they need to do. And it's, it's a unique profession where your goal is to not exist and not be needed. <laughs> so we have hit this point with HIV, which is a really remarkable tipping point where we can say, I think that this major epidemic that we have been battling for years, that we have been looking for the right tools, that we've been looking for that tipping point, we've hit it. And now we really think that we can eliminate the HIV epidemic and eliminate HIV transmission, which is something that not many of us who are public health practitioners really get a chance to do in our lifetimes. We kind of, we're, we kind of often feel like Don Quixote battling the windmill, you know? We, we try and try and try, and yet sometimes the, the problem is either misunderstood or bigger than us, and we don't have that opportunity. And here, what we have is an opportunity. So, there are a number of ways that we need to approach this and we need to look at this from all sides, from all levels of the community to really work and be able to eliminate HIV. So we need to diagnose, we need to treat, we need to protect, and we need to respond. And then we need boots on the ground workforce. So we are looking at a goal of 75% reduction in new HIV infections in five years. And we're looking for 90% in 10 years. And we really think we can do this. Um, so we are focusing uh, in phase one on that 75% and then the 90% and then intense case management after that to maintain a number of diagnoses at a very low level. Uh, and, and we really feel that with the tools that we have right now, this is doable. Um, and like I said, this is not just a federal department of health and it's not a local department of health or a state department of health. It's, it's uh, every primary care provider, it's every person knowing their status, it's, it's a whole of society organizational issue. And we really need to band together to do that. So this is a little bit more of a summary slide about how we're going to work towards those goals. And what we have here, has anybody heard about the high burden counties? So this uh, is based on our 2016-2017 data. The one thing you'll notice about the federal government is that the data comes out so slowly. <laughs> so this is at basically what we have as our most recent data set. But if you look at the burden of HIV in the US and you look, let me see if I can work the pointer now, you'll look right over here. Um, we're up here and actually out of the 48 highest burden counties, and the rest here. In, in my region, we have four high burden counties in New York State. We have two in New Jersey, and we have all of the municipios in the metro area of San Juan, Puerto Rico. So we actually have a pretty high preponderance of high uh, burden counties. And you can look across the country. I don't know if anybody else is from elsewhere in the country, but you can check and see whether your hometown might be one of those high burden counties. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be focusing really on these areas where the transmission and the burden are the highest, 
and we're going to be employing the best public health strategies that we can, the best medical strategies that we can to make sure that people are diagnosed, that they're linked to care, that they're in care, that they're virally suppressed. And then of course, at the same time, protecting people from new infections. And we, we are going to be placing emphasis as well on working on that stigma so that people do feel more comfortable getting care, engaging in PrEP. Uh, there are some exciting new models of PrEP that are coming out of other countries and there's a possibility of PrEP as an emergency uh, measure, which I think is, you know, maybe still a few years away for us for FDA approval, but that could be really game changing for PrEP where um, if somebody thought they might be engaging in risky activity, but weren't sure they might be able to take one pill 24 hours before the activity, another pill immediately after and another pill uh, some hours after that and be protected. And I think that those studies are ongoing, but there's a real chance that we might even be able to do that rather than having people who might be occasionally risking and risk occasionally engaging in risky behavior but not constantly engaging in risky behavior not have to be on prep at all points so that would be another interesting tool in our tool chest if it did come to be and uh, the the next very very small public health problem that we have uh, is our opioid epidemic are you all very well versed in the opioid epidemic? Is this just going to be a complete recap of everything that you've heard for the last five years, ten years? Um, are any of you aware that our Surgeon General has a personal experience with the opioid epidemic? Um, he speaks very freely about it and it, I think it's great because when we were talking about stigma for HIV, stigma for uh, substance use disorders and for addiction is, is as bad or worse. And so I think it goes a long way to have a Surgeon General say, this could be anybody. It could happen to anyone's family member, anyone's friend, it could, any person. And we need to understand that addiction is a brain disease. And I feel like we've been saying that now for quite a while, uh, but we have not really embraced the true meaning of that. So um, when we look at the opioid epidemic by the numbers, and again, this is based on 2017 data, and I can tell you I've sat in some of the high uh, intensity drug trafficking area meetings where we share some of our lab findings, and I can tell you that the numbers are, are a little different currently than they had been. But uh, 130 people are dying every day from opioid related overdoses and 11.4 million people misused prescription opioids. So that's not insignificant. Um, we, you can see all of the figures here, uh, almost a million people using heroin, 81,000 people using heroin for the first time, 2 million people misusing prescription opioids for the first time. So out of that 11.4 million, 2 million of them hadn't done that before. 15,482 deaths attributed to heroin and 28,466 deaths attributed to overdosing on synthetic opioids. And that's actually much worse now. Um, so what we've seen, and I'm sure some of you were probably about to say, hey, you know, you're ignoring fentanyl and you're ignoring this synthetic opioid issue. I promise you I'm not. <laughs> so uh, we have had three ways. This is not, it, when I go out into communities, uh, especially communities of color, they say, don't, don't talk to us about that. This, this is only a problem since it became a, a majority problem, but that this problem really in it, or it originated in communities, in urban communities, and in, in vastly minority communities years and years and years ago. And to not acknowledge that is actually insensitive to the, the people who have been suffering for the longest. And I, I acknowledge that and I agree with it. I think that when you're looking at the prescription opioid issue, we did see a rise in prescription opioids. At, at some point, we in the medical profession said, pain is no longer a manageable and expected uh, part of illness and recovery that pain should be ameliorated at all costs. And if a patient's in pain, then, then you're failing as a physician. And, and that 
became ingrained in medical teaching. And so really the, the, the public health and the medical profession, we absorbed some of the responsibility on this because what that did was set us up for an overuse of opioid prescriptions. And there, there are a number of other industries that promoted that and, and had a, a piece in that. However, we now come to a, a place where we've acknowledged that this is not the best medical model and it is putting some patients at risk and we're turning the other direction. So in 2010, we started to see a rise in heroin overdose deaths. And that actually also was not really, we didn't acknowledge, we didn't really see that this was a canary in the coal mine until 2013 when we started seeing synthetic opioid overdose deaths. And this is representative of the three waves and it really shows you, again, this is based on, I believe, 2017 data. So this is the most recent that we have. And what you see is this black line is other synthetic opioids. And so while we had commonly prescribed opioids in the purple and that that was rising and we had this spike in heroin beginning in 2010, this rise in synthetic opioid deaths is really what got everybody's attention because suddenly people were not just abusing uh, the, the drugs, they were dying from them. And dying from them in higher rates and with more frequency than they had before. So it's not that heroin can't kill you, it absolutely can. And it's actually not that uh, overdosing on prescription opioids can't kill you, it, it absolutely can. But it happened with much less frequency before we started seeing these synthetic opioids. What I can tell you is right now, fentanyl is the biggest uh, threat with synthetic opioids. And the, the number of fentanyl analogs that have been have been identified in the last year uh, has increased. And overall, the number of identified fentanyl analogs is 37. And in New York State, we have seen 18 of those fentanyl analogs. The one most of you are probably familiar with is carfentanyl, which is a very, very dangerous analog um, because it is so much more powerful than fentanyl. But it's becoming increasingly difficult for law enforcement as they're trying to figure out where the, the synthetic opioids are coming from. They, the more analogs there are, the more similar the molecular weights. So as the analogs become more and more, our analysis has to become more sophisticated in order to be able to trace the labs that are producing these analogs. It's a, it's a morbidly interesting topic. <laughs> So HHS has identified a five-point strategy to combat the opioids crisis. And you know, the first thing we need to do is better addiction prevention, treatment, and recovery services. I think that there was a longstanding acknowledgement uh, that we didn't always have treatment and recovery beds even for inpatient units, that the linkages to care weren't always there, that there was maybe not as much of a focus in some of the treatments on um, evidence-based treatments and finding the best evidence-based treatment. So we have really pushed forward on that to, to be able to increase that uh, provision of addiction prevention, but then also treatment and recovery services for those who do have addiction issues. The second one is better data, which is kind of funny given that I'm presenting to you 2017 data. Uh, but better data is important and we're finding ways to work in real time. So the federal government is partnering with um, the church. The federal government is partnering with uh, large companies like Google to look and see wh where they can find real time data. There's um, an RX stat platform that is a public health and public safety platform. Uh, people who are responding in communities can report in real time where they are seeing overdoses and overdose deaths and Narcan administration. So we are starting to get a better picture comprehensively of what's going on, which is really important because you cannot fight against an enemy that you cannot see. Uh, you can't do that effectively. So we're working on that. We're working on better pain management. 
Um, and, and this has been a really big issue on both sides because we do have patients who experience chronic pain and they do need pain treatment. And it, you can't just yank the opioids from those who had been using it to manage genuine chronic pain. Uh, so we're working on better methods for pain management, including reimbursement methods, including identifying alternative pain management models that maybe hadn't gotten attention before now. So there's a big push within the federal government to begin working on those and approving them and finding models that will be helpful to people who are genu genuinely suffering from pain. Um, we also are better targeting overdose re reversing drugs. And so that is a very fancy way of saying that we have pushed the availability of Narcan. Um, you can walk into a pharmacy in most states and ask for Narcan without having a prescription for it. Uh, if you have insurance, your insurance is probably reimbursing you for that, that uh, Narcan. So if you're asking for naloxone and you wanna carry it, you should be able to get it at little or no cost. And it is something that the Surgeon General has come out and recommended that everybody be able to do and carry. And we have seen a huge spike in the number of prescriptions that are, are being administered and the number of people who are carrying Narcan, which is very important. And I think initially what was happening was we just needed to get naloxone into the community. So we need to educate people about how to administer it and we need to get people willing to carry the naloxone. And now we're starting to hit a point where we have seen that uptake, but we have to now be a little bit more thoughtful and strategic. So this is a, a, an issue that we're looking at. How do we make sure that those who are most likely to need the naloxone, to, be, to administer the naloxone, are the ones who are increasing their uptake as well. So we're starting to be a little bit more strategic in that manner. And then number five is better research. So you know we, we are learning all sorts of things about the human genome. We were speaking about epigenetics before, about the developing adolescent brain and the, the types of changes that can happen when youth are experiencing opioids and, and the way that that can alter brain chemistry and, and even brain architecture. So we're working on research to figure out what are the things that we need to know and then once we know what we need to know, how do we uh, work through research to, to improve the prognosis and to, to reduce the addiction and overuse. That's an overview of opioids. HPV. Has anybody heard that Australia is on track to completely eliminate HPV? So Australia was one of the first countries to approve the HPV vaccine. And we followed, I wanna say 15 years behind-ish. So we're not quite there yet, but we are close. Uh, but the fact is that HPV almost every American will be infected with HPV at some point in their life. This is, of course, without vaccination. And each year, more than 30,000 Americans will develop the cancers that are caused by HPV. And you'll see in this pyramid here that these are the numbers of cancers attributed to HPV infections every year. And you will see that it's not just the ladies, the men are included here. Uh, so what we're looking at is 300,000 cases of cancer that could be eliminated by vaccination, which is an amazing feat of public health. However, we didn't always discuss this vaccine as a cancer prevention vaccine. And so we're playing a little bit of catch up. So HPV vaccination rates in the US are about 50% and there are significant disparities. So rural areas are seeing much, much, much lower rates of vaccination than urban areas. And the series initiation versus completion, even though now for most uh, people who are receiving the shot, the series is only two shots. So it's, uh, it, it, to complete the series, you only need to have two office visits. Uh, but we're still seeing about a 15% drop off from series initiation to series completion. So even in jurisdictions or states or areas that have, say, a school mandate where children need to be vaccinated in order to attend public school, you can see as high as a 90-something percent 
series initiation rate, but you still see about a 15% drop off on the series completion. So we have our work cut out for us. So we really believe that a future without HPV cancer is within reach. And this is another one of those public health moments where you think, oh my gosh, I can help eliminate 300,000 cases of cancer. And so many of those cancers are really deadly cancers. By the time they're diagnosed, they can be often deadly, especially in communities where access to care is an issue. So sometimes if you can't improve the access to care the way that you would like to, if you can prevent needing that access in the first place, at least in case, then you can prevent a death. Uh, so what we're doing is working with our, our National Vaccine Advisory Committee, uh, and they provided foundation for our HPV strategy. And this is what we're doing. We're engaging uh, communities. We are working with health systems engagement, and we're trying to figure out rural and faith-based needs and, and really address those in a, a sensitive way. The difficulty in particular as a public health practitioner and as a communicator is that initially this vaccine was marketed as a vaccine only for girls that was about sexual uh, activity. And that didn't go away. Once, once you send the wrong message out of the starting gate, you're going to spend the rest of your time battling with that message talked about. And the message we didn't realize at the time, because we were so excited to have this vaccine, right? And it's so promising, and of course everybody would want it, but sometimes in public health, we think like, of course everyone would want it, and anybody who's not in public health says, why would I want that? That's gonna make my kid have sex earlier, or my kid's never going to have sex. I mean, I have two girls, so I don't, I don't wanna think about them initiating sexual activity. And it's a much more persuasive argument to be able to say, if I could vaccinate your child and possibly prevent them from ever developing these types of cancers. Would you take that vaccine? And that's a much more persuasive argument. So we're really working on those issues. When you take away the, the nature of the transmission of HPV and you look at the outcomes, it's a much more persuasive argument. And we're really working on that. So we are working to unify our messaging, we're sharing our evidence-based practices and we're working on integrated delivery networks, we're advancing quality improvement, and then we're really working on, on that rural versus urban disparity. So our region in uh, June will be hosting an HPV meeting for large health systems, and we're going to be highlighting best practices. We actually are very fortunate. Our region has three HPV champions, which is not very common, uh, but we had an HPV champion uh, from CDC, uh, HPV's champion program in the first round of 2017, and they did 2018 HPV champions as well. And we had two in 2018. So we have three large health systems to draw from who had very different approaches to how they increased their HPV vaccination rates. So one size doesn't fit all when you're looking at a large health system, but there are specific best practices and approaches that each of them took that we're going to provide for them a platform to share. And then we're also going to work with our state and city jurisdictions to work on registry education. So educating about how to get the most benefit out of registry and recall systems. And then also to talk about how to encourage a strong provider recommendation because Anybody who has been to, does anyone in this room interact with pediatrics at all? Yeah, so, so you know, if you work with pediatrics, A, a pediatrician does not see the cancers that are caused by HPV. So there's a big divorce between the pediatrician whose responsibility it is to provide the ASIP recommended dose and the oncologist who ultimately sees the cancer. And that's a little bit hard because the pediatrician, like if they had seen a case of measles, then they know why measles is probably important to vaccinate against. It's a little bit more compelling of an argument. But when you have pediatricians who are not seeing the negative outcomes, and then you have parents who are experiencing maybe general vaccine hesitancy, and then on top of that, probably a little bit of this HPV, sexual promiscuity, hesitancy, that, that had been perpetuated beforehand, these providers are up against a lot in order to be making a strong provider recommendation. And when you're dealing with pediatrics, 
So whether you're the provider or the patient or the patient's parent, I had my own pediatrician come in and the nurse practitioner and, and the nurse assistant came in and each one of them said to us, today your daughter is due for X, 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 and X. Are we doing those? Well, that's not a strong provider recommendation. <laughs> And I don't think that it's generally acknowledged. These doctors have so much to do. They have a million patients waiting, they have billing, they, they have parents who are concerned that this kid isn't eating and that kid isn't sleeping and this kid has to get their physical for school. And to be able to make in a well child visit a strong provider recommendation might not be at the top of their mind. And I don't think that they realize even if the doctor makes the strong provider recommendation, we need to educate the entire office system so that they all, as they're speaking about these vaccines are saying, your child today is due for HPV and this booster, and uh, we will be administering them. They're a part of the, the schedule. And you don't, if, if there's a question, trust me, parents are gonna ask. If there's a hesitancy, they're gonna tell you, oh no, I don't want that. And then you have to be able to educate the provider to have that discussion, and they need to have the time to have that discussion with the patient. Uh, but outside of that, that counseling, just that recommendation at the outset can make a huge difference in whether a parent is going to accept the vaccine or not for their child. And we know that the earlier that kids are vaccinated within the suggested window, the better the immune response to the vaccine. So it's really important that they get vaccinated closer to the beginning of the window rather than the end. By the time you hit 26, it's, you know, the ship has already sailed. Now we also have uh, an increased ACIB recommendation up through the age of uh, 45. We're, we're looking at that, but it's actually less of a goal for us than it is to work with the kids who are coming in to age into the vaccine. Uh, part of the reason being so many Americans are already exposed to many of these strains. And so it's a diminishing returns, but there are specific cases where somebody might be high risk or had been low risk in the past and maybe becoming high risk. Um, we see a lot of people in now who have what you might call a starter marriage, and they will be in a committed relationship from their early 20s or late teens until their mid to late 20s, and then uh, they, they're leaving those relationships, and then they may be in a place of promiscuity where they had been in some way inoculated from having uh, the, the risk in the past. So there are cases like that, and it is important. But for us, the biggest push is really to work on the younger end of the age spectrum to make sure that we're getting the vaccines. And if we can get these kids vaccinated, then we can eliminate HPV in the country. So that would be really exciting. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. We're working on a million different issues. We are working on hepatitis C. We're working on minority health. We're working on women's health. We're working on cardiovascular health. We're working on youth sports. Uh, but these were kind of the big ones that are emerging trends that I thought you might be more interested in hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Did anybody see the New York Times editorial? a couple of weeks ago. So my boss, the Assistant Secretary, Admiral Brett Giroir, and the Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, and the CDC Director, Robert Redfield, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times titled, Why We Need to Fear the Disease and Not the Vaccine. So yeah, we're working on it. As a psychologist, my challenge is this is a really tricky area for communication because in public health, our inclination is to provide people with the facts. And when we're public health practitioners or medical practitioners, we cannot imagine why in the world, if I tell you that something is bad for you, if I tell you that it could kill you, if I tell, why would you not take these facts and go, okay, yeah, I get it. But you cannot reason with belief. It is very hard to reason with belief. And so you know, when, when we're working on these issues, it's, it's not always as straightforward as we would like. And it's very counterintuitive for traditional public health communication because our traditional public health communication is, that's bad for you, that's good for you. And everyone goes, okay, 
sure. Like it's, it's not good for us to be sedentary and eat Doritos all day. So, all right, I get it. I'll try to change my behavior. Now, no promise, but like they understand and they're, they're receiving that information. But can you imagine if you told somebody sitting around all day, not moving and eating 15 bags of Doritos is probably going to result in some type of cardiovascular event for you that may kill you. It might take a while, but you're going to get there. This is really, really bad for you. And they say, those are all lies. That's propaganda. That is the government trying to control my life. That is traditional medicine not acknowledging my right to make decisions for myself. This is my bag of Doritos. So can you imagine arguing with that? <laughs> you do it all the time. <laughs> and, and so we do have this. But to make a case for vaccination, somebody who truly believes that the vaccine itself is going to be far worse than whatever disease their child or they could contract. And then on top of they think that the, the disease itself, I, you know, I've had anti-vaxxers say, well, Mac, you know, the measles doesn't kill anybody. That's all a lie. Okay, well, I can give you a, a WHO fact sheet about how many people around the world die from measles every year. No, that's a lie. So it's really difficult. And the anti-vaxxers are very well funded. And they do get the ear of members of, of communities and once you have that notion that someone is, is really holding to as fact, that is in fact belief, uh, it's really hard to counter that. So it's frustrating and it's difficult. And I think we're seeing uh, public opinion begin to shift in some states. There are states that are really looking at their vaccine exemptions. And, and of course, there are always going to be legitimate health and maybe even legitimate religious exemptions for these vaccines. But to, to give a blanket exemption is maybe, uh, has maybe moved the needle a little bit too far. On the other hand, there are people, especially in the Pacific Northwest where the measles outbreak has been the worst, who had been very, very anti-vaccine and are really starting to see what's happening with these diseases. And, and seeing members of their community adversely affected, and they are starting to vaccinate. So I don't want to say, oh, I hope that they see how when a kid gets really sick from the measles, because nobody wants that. But um, sometimes those are the types of events that, that make people think. It's the same thing with flu vaccine. You know, we see a lot of resistance to flu vaccine. People think they're going to get the flu from the vaccine. It's not effective. They think that it won't help. And you can tell somebody, well, you know, strains are not exactly matched. If you contract the flu, your flu strain will probably be much less severe than it would have been otherwise. But they don't really think that, oh, I never get the flu. The one year I got the flu shot, I got the flu. And I got it right after I had the shot, and it had to have been from the shot. So then what we see is people dying from complications from the flu. And this, this notion, again, public health, wanting to champion you know, the good cause and everybody wants to be altruistic and everybody wants to help their fellow mankind. And, and I think at our core, we really do, but it doesn't always make the argument that we think it does to say, well, you know, you vaccinating yourself and your family protects the baby down the street. I don't think it resonates as much as we would like it to sometimes, especially if people have that fear that they mistrust the vaccines. And you know, as a federal government, we, we know that we have a legacy, that we've also perpetuated some mistrust in communities. Um, so we, we have a battle to fight because it's, it's a fight worth fighting. It saves lives. I'll say an item of belief. I think we just heard a brilliant, cogent, and very well thought out uh, structure for how to approach people who are having trouble with scientific information and having trouble uh, uh, synthesizing it. So Mark, great question, great answer. I think we have time for a couple more. Uh, I think Dr. Berna was first, sorry. You told us that the anti-vaccine are well First of all, is that believable? Because the measles are not really that 
And is there a way to continue their funding? I couldn't tell you. What I know is that in a recent New York outbreak, that there was an anti-vax organization that was making robocalls to the community. And nobody robocalls without funding. So when you have your health department figuring out whether they can print another flyer, and you have robocalls on the other side, it's a little bit of a challenge. So I, I don't really, I'm not well versed in, in the actual mechanisms of funding for these organizations, but I do know that if they're doing things like that, they must have funding. Dozer. Well, right. And I should explain by clarification that uh, Dr. Smith Harak has many agencies reporting to her. EPA, EPA is not one of them. Is not one of them, although they are right across the street from. Her I do office. look at them out of my office, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and we do work with them, of course. ATSDR, which is part of CDC, is also funded in large part through EPA dollars. There's the funding streams, but I I do not represent EPA. What I can say is that, in general, as the federal government, we don't do a lot of shameless self-promotion. We think it's enough to stand on its own. And you know, it's just kind of because we feel so strongly in the work that we're doing. There's, there's a saying, and probably it's the same with academia or anything else, but no one, no one goes into the, the federal government or into government or public health to get rich. Like it's just, if you want to get rich, you're working on Wall Street. You're not really hanging out doing public health work. So those of us who are doing public health and probably, Sorry I'm guessing. That, should, have, should have disclosed that at the beginning right. of the semester. Yeah, I'm sure there might be one-offs. Some, some really great social impact investment models, but it, we don't do a great job of it. Yet. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that we, especially CDC, has been doing a lot of thought and, and has really great resources on communication and clinician outreach and, and, and teaching clinicians how to make, especially in the case of vaccines, a strong provider recommendation and to have the difficult conversation. Because what we know is not just that you're no longer considered omnipotent and you can't just tell the patient what to do. Uh, that uh, right. Well, part of the problem is that the, pr the practitioner needs to be able to have the time and the knowledge base to persuade the, the, in the right direction, in the interest of the patient, because of course you have the Hippocratic Oath and you never want to persuade a patient to do anything that's not in their best interest. So that goes without saying. But when you have that patient in the room and you say, you know, I, I really think that we need to start looking at your weight. Let's just do something a little bit more, more benign. We need, we need to look at your weight. You know, you're, you're five pounds into the obesity range. I'm concerned about the ramifications. You know, how do you have that conversation? And that's something that I think in you know, medical education, and we have the new dean of the medical school, medical education can really work with us on this. It could be a really beautiful partnership. Because I think it's something that needs to be taught in the same way that we teach students how to do a medical exam or how to start an IV or whatever it is that they might be learning that's a, a traditional clinical practice. Having a conversation about how to make the right decision with a patient is something that doesn't come naturally to every physician. And so that informed consent relies on the patient trusting you and on you being able to provide the information the patient is looking for 
in a cohesive and understandable way and giving them the tools to make the right decision. And while you may know what the right decision is and you may know the medical reasons for it, to have that conversation, especially when you might be limited to a 15 minute clinical visit, it's a very difficult thing to do. And so it's a skill that could really be built. And I should say, uh, as a shameless plug, <laughs> that part of that skill, many aspects of that skill, are taught right here uh, at New York Medical College in the School of Health Science and Practice, public <laughs> health program. Uh, Dr. Chen and her colleagues in the health education division uh, will teach what amounts to a whole 40 to 50 year literature on risk communication to populations as well as risk communication at the personal individual level. So awesome. there is a field of expertise and, and we teach that. I think you had a question there? Yeah. yeah. Right. So I think it's, it's interesting because FQHCs are finally federally funded. That's, that's the F part of it. And actually, I think we are now referring to them as CHCs, community health centers. But they, they receive this federal funding. And at least for New York City, uh, and at least for the HPV data, what we see is that children who are 317 eligible, which means they're eligible to receive free vaccines because their families are below a certain income level, are getting vaccines at a much higher rate than children who are privately insured. And part of that is that the FQHCs or CHCs are doing a really good job, which is awesome, like we cheer for them. Also the public hospital systems, so the public hospital systems and the not-for-profit hospital systems that are required to do needs assessments and set specific goals in specific areas are doing a great job. So depending, it could sometimes, like I said, it's a rural versus urban issue and sometimes it's a wealthy versus not wealthy issue, which is strange. It's a private insurance issue, uh, and it's counterintuitive. Uh, we see the same thing in New York City work for flu vaccine rates. Um, minorities and 317 eligibles get the flu vaccine with more frequency. You know, maybe part of it is that the, that population can't afford to get sick. And maybe that's part of it, but there might be more receptivity but also I do think that those, those FQHCs and CHCs who are federally funded and have um, federal initiatives and federal training behind them are getting a lot more of that benefit in making that recommendation and, and in, in addressing the issues. Likewise with uh, screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment. Um, I think uniformly we're seeing decreases in opioid prescriptions, which makes sense. Um, and also we're seeing a more uniform screening uh, of, of, you know, for substance use disorders. So I think that that is a little bit more across the board, but at least when you're talking about vaccines, you do definitely see uh, many FQHCs are doing, uh, a, I don't wanna say a better job, but they're having more success with vaccinating larger portions of the population. And we think it could be in part due to the 317 program. I think we have time for one more question. There is one more, Jeffrey Patrick. So, 
me. So what we don't have is in my office, I won't say across the, the federal government, NIH has done a lot of research, uh, and I know that the VA also does a lot of research and puts a lot of money into TBI. Uh, so we don't have like a federally coordinated strategy that my office is responsible for. But I can say that what we are seeing is with greater attention being drawn towards especially uh, professional sports and TBI, we're seeing a lot of these organizations put into place policies that remove the athletes from the activity if there is a suspected concussion and a lot more emphasis on evaluating concussion. Uh, and that has trickled down from all the way up in the professional athletic sphere into all the way down to, to high school and junior high. Yeah. Right. So, the next thing is that I think they spent so much time practicing training as well. Kids do practice time and game time. And game time is their time. part of contact, right? Yeah. I think the approach and to actually take a look at the high school kids and how they practice. Here's my recommendation to you, or my ask of you. Ready? Because you don't get to ask a question without being asked to do something else. Um, the Fitness Council on Fitness, Sport, and Nutrition, PCFSN, is asking for comments on their youth sports plan right now. And I think it's important to raise that and share that comment so that can there is going to be a large nationwide youth sports initiative. Thank you. Uh, once again, I want to thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much. For speaking to us. Um, I saved a couple announcements for the very end. Uh, first of all, as you've already heard, uh, our new Dean of the Medical School has joined us this afternoon, Dr. Jerry Nadler. Please stand so everybody can see you. It's great to have you here and welcome aboard. And also, uh, Jeffrey Patrick asked me to make the announcement that if any of this interests you, and if you'd like to learn more about anything related to public health, please come to National Public Health Week events in our very school, uh, coming up the first week of April, beginning with April 1st, Monday, and going right across uh, to the end of the week. Uh, look up the schedule. It's on the uh, universal calendar as well as on the video monitors around the campus. Please come to National Public Health Week. Our leadoff event Monday night is a keynote address by none other than our Vice Dean Emeritus, uh, James O'Brien. Jim O'Brien, who is a Vice Dean here for many, many years, is coming back for a revisit and keynote address. So please come for that. Uh, I want to say that not only did we hear about HIV, opiates, HPV, and a whole bunch of other issues that intertwine with reaching the hard to reach, trying to get, as uh, April said, as trying to get the best possible good for as many people as possible. When you get to the federal system, there are so many different agencies, including the EPA, which even though it's not part of Health and Human Services, holds itself out as a public health agency. Read their website. The mission of EPA is protecting public health and the environment. Public health first, environment second. And so it takes someone like April to pull all of these different initiatives and programs together to have the most amazing mental Rolodex. Does anybody use that word anymore, Rolodex? to have the world's ama most amazing Rolodex of knowing which program can impact on this group, this group or that activity. Uh, and she does extra extraordinarily well. She's done it for a number of years and we really appreciate your service to our region and our nation. And in that regard, if Fiona will please help me. Everybody, Fiona is my new scheduler. If you remember Aline, this is Fiona. So. Polite rounds of applause for Fiona. We want to present you with this plaque 
to commemorate your being part of the Dean's Leadership Lecture Series and so that you can always remember with pleasure your time spent with us this afternoon. Thank you so, so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. This will find a place of honor in my office, I Good. promise. Thank you. And please say hi to everybody. I will. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Public Health Week, April 1st. Jim O'Brien, not to be missed.